the scriptures, we have this unique scene presented to us, and it's where Jesus ascends into heaven for the final time. Now, this is a very important time that captures our attention because it's the last time the disciples will see Jesus physically upon the earth. And so we listen to the words of Christ and he says, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Now you guys go make disciples, go into all the world, teach everyone everything that I've commanded you. And so that's what we see in that departure. Sometimes we forget that the final words of Jesus recorded in the scripture aren't found in the gospels, but are found in the book of Revelation. The apostle John was someone who experienced extreme persecution. There was even a point where he was arrested and forced to live in exile on the island of Patmos. And this wasn't a luxury type of island. It was very difficult to survive in a place, in a setting like Patmos. But yet it's here where John receives this revelation of Jesus Christ. And this is where we get our final book of the scripture, the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, Jesus informs us a lot of what will take place during the end of the age or the end times. But before he gets into that, Jesus addresses seven literal churches that were in existence during the time of the apostle John. I think it's very important for us to look at Jesus's words to these seven churches because everything that he says is absolutely applicable to where we sit in the church almost 2,000 years later. So again, we look at the timing. If we look at the timeline of the uh, outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost and the writing of the book of Revelation, there is this 60-year window. So some of the churches that have that are being addressed in Revelation have been in existence for several decades now. So it's interesting to see what Jesus' words are to those churches who are somewhat established. So there's a lot of information to cover, and we could dedicate a single session to every church that's addressed in those two chapters of Revelation. But what I wanted to do in our time together is to look collectively at some of the things Jesus says in his letters to these seven churches. And at the end, we'll look at two churches specifically before we close down our time together. But again, on a very uh, collective stance, we look and see um, what are some of the things that Jesus praises the churches for in the book of Revelation. And Jesus praises uh, the church for good deeds, for hard work, for for perseverance, for not tolerating uh, wicked people or false teaching. He praises them for enduring hardship because of him, through serving him. He he, um, praises the fact that they haven't grown weary and that they've remained faithful and their love for him. Uh, On the other side, what are some things that Jesus rebukes the churches for? He rebukes them for leaving their first love, for holding on to false teaching, for participating in sexual immorality and eating food sacrificed to idols. He rebukes them for having a reputation of being alive, yet while inwardly being dead. And we see that there are some different action steps for the different churches. On one end, he calls churches to repent. And on the other end, he encourages them to remember, to remain steadfast in the faith. Now, again, there's a lot of information to cover, but I want to focus specifically on two churches. And the first church is the church in Ephesus. Now, the church in Ephesus is an outstanding church and has this rich history of leadership. The Apostle Paul, John, Aquila, Priscilla, Apollos, Timothy, all have connections with this church in Ephesus. And so let's read what Jesus has to say to a church like them. This is what we read in Revelation 2, beginning at verse 2. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name, and have not grown weary Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. So what is the love the Ephesian church had at first? Some would say it's love for Christ or it's the love that they have for one another as believers. And some would say it's a combination of both that oftentimes in the New Testament, you see this partnership 
of love for Christ and love for members of the household of faith. But what we see is that there was this initial sweeping passionate love that the church in Ephesus had, but it slowly started to drift away. Now, we remember that the church in Ephesus is uh, honored, is commended for right teaching and not tolerating uh, false apostles and they're uh, praised for all of their works and their deeds. And so what I see in this is that it is possible to do all of the right things, to preach the right things, to believe the right things, all the while slowly allowing your love for Christ and others to fade into the background. And I think that's a big challenge for us as the people of God today, just as it was for the church in Ephesus. You see, what I've come to discover is that it's easier to do things for God. It is easier to do stuff on behalf of Christ than it is to stop, to sit in the presence of the Savior, to worship Him, receive from Him, to learn from Him, and to be changed by the power of His Spirit. As human beings, we are designed for work. We are designed to be active, to do things. So that is very natural for us. At times, it's not natural for us to go and sit in the presence of our Savior, to be confronted by the Word, and to rearrange our lives in humble submissiveness to the Word of God and to the acts and the work of the Holy Spirit. And so it is easier to preach messages. It's easier to feed the poor. It's easier to go on missions trips. It's easier to lead small groups at times than it is to allow the work of Christ to infiltrate you and to keep you moving forward in the things of God and to keep your love alive for him. It's easy to allow activity to replace our love for Christ. See, when we talk about the supremacy of Jesus, it's simple to understand that Christ will not share his seat of supremacy with acts of immorality, with acts of wickedness, idolatry. But we also have to remind ourselves that Christ will not share his place of supremacy, even with good and honorable works. Our love for him must be central to everything that we do. You see, as Christians, we don't perform work for the sake of performing work. We perform work that is generated out of our love and communion we have with our Savior. Without question, work is connected to the Christian existence, to the Christian life. But where that work comes from is highly significant. You see, we are called to be people who work. The Bible even says um, that faith without works is dead. So there is this outworking of our salvation, of uh, the things that are transpiring in our life. The work of the Holy Spirit is manifested in our mortal flesh. But yet it comes from the place where Christ is central and our love for him drives these good works. You see, Ephesus had great practice. And they had great teaching. But somehow they loosened the grip that they had on the love that they had for Christ and for one another. And I don't think that this was similar to the act of the Pharisees in the Gospels. I think that the church in Ephesus had this genuine desire to live life that was pleasing to the Savior. But yet in their efforts to do that, their love for him drifted. I'm reminded of the story in Luke chapter 10 where Jesus visits Mary and Martha. And as he walks into their home, Mary sits at the feet of Jesus. But Martha is busy rushing around, trying to be a good host, trying to perform the greatest hospitality possible in serving Jesus, doing things for him. After all, he is the Messiah. And so Martha is running around and she actually observes Mary at the feet of Jesus and becomes upset. And she tells Jesus, Jesus, will you tell, your sis tell my sister to come and help me perform and be a good host and do all of these things? And Jesus looks at Martha and says, my dear Martha, 
You are worried and upset over all of these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about, and Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken from her. Martha was worried about works and action, and Mary was there cherishing relationship and communion. Let me encourage you, do not allow activity to rob you of your relationship or that genuine desire and love for your Savior. What we do see is in verse 5, in the event that it does take place and our affections and our hearts drift away from its first love, Jesus calls us to repentance. He says, consider how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things that you did at first. So we have this assurance that even when we make mistakes and even when things get out of alignment, Jesus gives us this remedy. And the remedy is repentance. And that we have this available to us, this tender, loving Savior who will uh, not only inform us when things are out of line, but tell us the way to come back to him. The next church that I want to talk about is the church in Thyatira. Now, Thyatira was known to be a manufacturing center for the cloth industry. And so what would happen for a person to be successful in this industry? They would join a guild or a merchant association. And often these guilds would throw on these lavish parties. And at the parties, uh, people that were members of the guilds would take cups of wine and they would pour them out as an act of worship to pagan deities. Afterwards, they would uh, engage in excessive drunkenness and there would be a lot of sexual immorality that would follow afterwards. So you can imagine what life would be like for a person who was active in the clothing industry, having an encounter with the person of Jesus Christ, that Christ has transformed their life and now they're trying to live in a manner that's pleasing, that's holy and righteous before God and yet still having to participate in this industry and there being this collision of two different worlds, of two different lives, a new life and a former life. And so some of these individuals uh, in Thyatira would now have to perhaps relinquish their livelihood, their job, their association with these guilds or merchant associations in order to be obedient to the life that Christ had called them to live. And so it was in the testing uh, of, of this uh, commitment level that we see people uh, and their genuine faith flourishing. I knew someone, a man several years ago, a Christian man who left a company to go work for a new company. And his new company, he would have greater responsibility he would have greater opportunity, greater freedom of time, and also a larger paycheck. Well, this Christian man eventually started to see that within this new company, the owners of the company were engaged in extremely unethical behavior. And there were a lot of things that were taking place, including excessive drug use. And there was an expectation now that he was part of the company that he would be involved in this activity. And so there was this challenge. As a Christian, he knew the life that he was called to live, and he knew that that was running in direct opposition to the life that his new employers were now expecting him to live. And eventually, he had to walk away from that job in order to be a committed Christ follower. Now, some of you may have been in experiences like that, or following Christ has cost you in some way, shape, or form. So we think about those who are engaged in the cloth industry, and Thyatira now receiving the gospel and now they're being this challenge. What do they do next? And so in this environment, this is what we read in Jesus' letter to the church in Thyatira. I know your deeds, your love and your faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet by her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. So what we see in Thyatira, it appears that there is this woman 
who was a self-proclaimed prophet, and she's leading the church people astray, saying it's okay to participate in sexual immoral behavior. It's okay to honor pagan deities by eating meats that are sacrificed to them. And so that's very interesting considering what we know about the environment of the guilds and the merchant associations in Thyatira. So it's perhaps that there is this woman that has arisen who said, you know what? Yes, you have made a decision for Christ, but it's okay to participate in sexual immorality. It's okay to worship and honor these other gods. You can have the best of both wor worlds. And we know that this teaching was detestable and Christ called her to repentance, this specific woman, but she would not repent. And so this is what we see is that on one end, we have this challenge going out of the gospel message in a very difficult environment. And then we have a false prophet arising saying, no, 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 no. Let me promote an easier gospel that won't require much change in order for you to be a legitimate Christian. Undoubtedly, we see this conflict today. We often hear the message of just love Jesus and everything is good. There's no uh, paying attention to sin, moral behavior, the holiness of God. Just love Jesus and you'll be fine. Just love Jesus and everything will be fine. And yet there's not an appeal to righteous and holy living. In fact, the appeal is simply love Jesus, which is interesting because Jesus says, if you love him, you'll keep his commandments. And what do we know about his commandments? The commandments of Christ promote godliness, promote holy and right living. But yet there are people and institutions and unfortunately churches that try to present the gospel message in a way where people can have one foot in the kingdom of God and one foot in the kingdoms of the world and it does not work. So we see this message in Thyatira where Jesus is calling them back to proper teaching. What's interesting is that in Ephesus, they had right teaching and they're performing good works but they had lost their first love. In Thyatira, they possessed a love for Christ, but yet they were walking away from proper and sound doctrine. And so what do we see? That there is this partnership that doctrine without love is worthless, but love without proper teaching is lifeless. And so we must hold the two in the balance. Legitimate, genuine love for Jesus and proper teaching that produces proper living. You see, what we see is Christ demands radical obedience. And when we choose to obey, there is a cost. Sometimes we lose relationships. Sometimes we lose friendships, family members. Sometimes we lose our jobs. Sometimes in extreme cases, people lose their life. But the message of the gospel is not only worth dying for, it is definitely worth living for. And the gospel is an incredible message because what we see is that we were left to our own devices and Jesus stepped in and he gave us a way of escape and provided salvation for us. And he filled us with his spirit and he filled us with this incredible love. And he gave us his spirit, which also leads us into truth. And there again, we have this partnership of love and truth. And it's important for us to hold to both of those things, especially in the day and age in which we live. Church, we can't depart from the understanding. We can't depart from the things that we know are true. And while we hold fast to that which is true, we must possess a genuine love for Christ and a love for others as well. That's why it's imperative for us to revisit these words, the words recorded in Revelation, to look at what Jesus would say to these uh, newly established churches and line ourselves up and, want, and, and, and begin to examine ourselves and to see if there is a need for repentance. Is there a need for us to perhaps change some things regarding our love and our priorities? Are there some things that need to change 
in our teaching so that we can believe what is right so we live that which is right. Today, I just want to encourage you, if you're in a place where you're saying, I have been filling my life with activity and I have noticed that I've kind of departed from having Christ as being that first love, just know that the problem and that issue can be resolved immediately through confession and repentance. And perhaps as you've gone with us in this homegrown reading plan, you've been confronted with the truth of Scripture and it's challenged you to maybe correct the course of your life or attitude or action. Just know that you can take that corrective action and that God gives you the ability and the strength so that you do not have to do it on your own. He fills us with love and he fills us with truth. I think that's important for us as his people to remember today and the next. Today we end our homegrown series and it's been a privilege uh, to be in this journey with you. My hope is that as you've been going through the homegrown series that you have been revisiting the word on a regular basis and as you have it has been allowing your love for Jesus to grow. It's also my hope that as you revisit the scripture and rediscover truth that you will shape your life by the truth that you receive in God's word, in God's word proper truth and proper doctrine and from that it has caused you to live a vibrant and exciting life for Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May his grace flow through you. Amen. <music>